So why are we reclaiming Paul? Now, first of all, let me tell you that I love the writings of the Apostle Paul. I feel like sometimes when I'm studying his letters that I almost know him. He is such a strong personality and a strong voice that comes out, and he does such good theology in his letters. But often his writings or writings that have been attributed to him um, have been used to do harm, or even they've just been read too simply. And a lot of the really deep theological meaning that, that he's trying to convey just gets lost. Now, particularly, and I want to name this as we get started, women and members of the LGBTQ community have been especially harmed when Paul gets misuse, misused or read too simply. And honestly, I find it ironic that people want to hold up Paul as this voice that says no to people in the church when Jesus himself actually affirmed women in ministry and at first appeared in the resurrection to women to go and preach the resurrection. And Jesus is entirely silent with any condemnation of same sex or same gender relationships. And even in fact, breaks a lot of gendered norms and, and gendered behaviors of his time. So we need to reclaim Paul away from the voices that want to use Paul to tell people to stay out or to tell people to stay quiet. Because what I think Paul is actually doing is, is setting a lot of people free. Paul's, Paul's preaching a gospel that, that's good news, that has requirements. Paul does not te preach cheap grace, but he does good practical theology for the churches that he is in ministry to. And he takes the good news that he knows, that he encountered on that Damascus road and in his raising up of other, other, other church members, and he applies it to real life situations. He applies it to real problems that are happening in those churches at that time. And to understand that, we have to know the context he's speaking into and how he's trying to teach these churches. We can't read Paul as universal, universal prescriptions for Christian behavior. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is that it actually elevates him over Jesus. If we want to know exactly how we need to be, we have the example in the Gospels. We're supposed to be as Christ-like as we possibly can. So when we take Paul as the example of Christian behavior, we're saying that his advice is more important than the example of the incarnation of God that we have in the, in the Gospels. But it's also a misuse of Paul to turn what he's saying into just a bunch of rules, a checklist for what we have to do and what we can't do, because that's actually the opposite of what Paul is usually saying. He would, I think, be surprised and pretty unhappy with us if we take his writings and, and condense it down to a to-do list. But it also misses the point of how we take what we know of the gospel and, and turn it into discipleship and apply it to us now. I think it's hard for us to read passages like the one we have today from 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, because a lot of passages like that are hard to find meaning in because they've been used to drive things like purity culture. Now, before I get further into this passage, I just want to let any parents that are watching with little ones know, obviously this passage talks about sex and sexuality and uh, sexual immorality, uh, uses the term fornication uh, in some translations. And so that's, that's part of what we're talking about today. And so if you have little ones that you're not quite ready to have those conversations with them or to explain what some of those words mean, this might be an okay sermon to watch for just older kids or just adults. So one of the ways that Paul gets misused, and especially passages like the one we read today and why it's important for us to actually unpack what Paul is really saying, is that passages like this get used to drive things like purity culture. Now, if you're not familiar with what purity culture is, it's really predicated on just this complete denial of sexual desire, of sexuality outside of heterosexual marriage. And it's a way of teaching usually young people to think about their sexuality and their bodies 
that is rife with shame and totally absent, honestly, of, of grace, it reduces us down and our relationships and our sexual relationships down to something that's very transactional. And purity culture is most certainly homophobic, but it's also really misogynistic. It tends to get more applied to women uh, and to young women in, youth, in church youth groups than it does to, to boys and to men and to young men. And honestly, purity culture was the, the primary teaching uh, in a lot of church youth groups, mine included, for decades. And it's still really promoted in evangelical churches. So it's hard for us sometimes to see what Paul is talking about in these passages where he's addressing something like sexuality and bodies because we have this baggage from things like purity culture. Now, let me be clear that Paul does absolutely have a pretty conservative sexual ethic. And his sexual ethic is actually complete abstinence. <laughs> um, in, a, in a few passages after this, you see him saying like, yeah, don't, don't touch each other. But if you absolutely can't, here are the boundaries around which you can do that. But Paul is also working out of a context where there, is, there are cultic sexual practices, things around um, uh, cultic prostitution that is actually tied to idolatry. Um, and related to other religions that some of those early Christians would have been coming out of, just like there are dietary practices that he's talking about that are tied to other religions. But there's also this really strong philosophical influence that Paul has on him and that is prevalent in his time where he sees the physical body as sort of a hindrance to the freedom and holiness of the soul. And that's not ne that doesn't necessarily jive with the First Testament, or even with some of Jesus' teachings. Um, and certainly, you know, we in our time have perhaps a more holistic understanding of our bodies and our souls being both created and both beloved by God. So we have to understand that Paul's really got some pretty strong ideas that maybe don't necessarily apply to us in their entirety. So all of that is to say that there's lots of layers of context in this passage that we're reading today, but also in most of Paul's writings that we really have to unpack before we can say that there's any kind of one-to-one -one relationship between Paul's advice to a church like the one in Corinth and to our lives today. But I think also, and I said this before, that if we read a passage like the one we read today, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, if we read that passage and we only see Paul talking about food and sexual immorality, by the way, the, the word fornication that's in there, a better translation maybe is immoral sexual practices uh, coming from the Greek. Um, if we only read that passage as being about those two things, we're really missing a lot. We're missing the bigger rhetorical picture. Paul constructs arguments in a masterful way. <laughs> um, and we're also missing the theological things that he's doing to try to actually lead people closer to Jesus into a new way of living and a new way of living together. So those are some things that we've got to understand anytime that we approach Paul, but especially related to the passage we're looking at today. So a little bit, of, a little bit more <laughs> context about 1 Corinthians, about this letter. The Corinthian church is, a place, uh, is in a place where there are a lot of opportunities to indulge. There's a lot of worship happening of other gods um, in ways that we would not even think of as worship as modern Christians. A lot of, a lot of idolatry for people to fall into. There's also a lot of diversity in this church. There's diversity of, um, of religious background. There's diversity of class and status. We know there's gender diversity in this church. And so there's, they're struggling as a church to navigate how they live together, and especially how they live together as a transformed community, as a community that is different from the world around it and has a sense of identity in itself. So there's clearly a back and forth happening between Paul and between this first Corinth, this uh, community in Corinth, this Christian community. And this letter that we have is a response to something that was written to Paul, and we don't have that. 
We don't know what the letter Paul received said. And so we don't exactly know the questions Paul is trying to answer, but we can sort of guess. And if you take it upon yourself to read all of 1 Corinthians, which you totally should, um, you'll see him say several times, now concerning. And when you see one of those now concernings, you know he's moving on to make another point. They give us a little bit of, of phrasing, to use a musical term, in uh, how Paul is constructing his arguments, which usually are long. Usually Paul is working something out, not just in one verse, and maybe not even just in one chapter, but over a, seri over a long period of time in those letters. Now, before this passage that we read today in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5 and chapter 6, Paul's addressing some really specific bad behavior in the church. He is not happy with the Corinthians. But more broadly than that, he is talking about how the church should handle behavior within its own boundaries, within its own community, how to handle that and also how not to handle that. And he's also addressing the attitude of pride that some members of this church seem to have. So the bigger picture for Paul in this passage is, is about how Christians live together and how they practice a transformed way of living. And all the, the stuff about uh, bodies and sex and food, those are actually examples he's using to try to drive his point home. Those are things that he would have expected them to agree with. So there's a couple of big arguments that Paul's making in this letter, a couple of big points that I think are things that we actually can take away to help us understand what it means to live together as Christians. So the first big point that he's trying to make in this section of 1 Corinthians is that those Corinthians Christians and us, we're all part of something that's a lot bigger than ourselves. We're, we're not alone anymore. We're not even really individuals anymore. Now we're part of a body. And by that body, he means the community of faith. But for Paul, he also understands us to be part of Christ himself. And so if we are part of a community that is the body of Christ in the world, but that we are also through that community and through the sacrament, joined to the body of Christ itself, then whatever we do, whatever they were doing, we have to think about how it relates to that union with Christ and to each other. There's a little bit of understanding of, of witness in here. Of, of how, do, what, how are we showing the world the body of Christ in our behavior and how we treat each other and how we act and how it reflects on everyone else. But it goes even deeper than that. It's, just not, it's not just about our witness. It's about sort of what, what acts we bring into the body, how we are a member of that body. What, and I, I can't help but think of Matthew 25, when I read this, and Jesus teaching people at the end of that chapter that whatever you do to the least of these, you're doing to Christ himself. If you are feeding and, and housing and clothing and, and healing people, you're doing that to Christ. If you are denying those things to people, you're denying them to Christ. When we call ourselves Christians, when we take part in the resurrection, or, or rather, when we claim the resurrection, when we claim eternal life through Christ, we are joined to him. Whatever we do, whatever we do is not done as individuals, but is done as part of the body of Christ. And this idea of the body of Christ is fundamental to Paul's understanding of what it means to be a Jesus follower. Now, I think this part is really hard for us to hear um, as 21st century American Christians. Um, we have seen in the past 10 months how hard it is to make decisions, not just thinking about yourself, not just thinking about your own family, but thinking about people that you might not even know and how your behavior, whatever that is, whether it's wearing a mask or staying at home or spending your money, whatever you're doing, whatever it is, how hard it is to think of your own personal behavior as actually having a real effect on another person. And it sounds like from this letter that that's actually pretty hard for the Corinthians to hear too. But when we become Christians, 
When we participate in the sacrament, when we take the body of Christ into ourselves, when we say that we are part of that body, we are no longer our own. And this, honestly, I think should be more relief than burden. Because it means that we're not abandoned. It means that we have a place. It means that we have, have security in a way that we, we, we don't have otherwise. But it is also a responsibility. It also means that we have to think about what we're doing, that we have to, about, that we have to watch how we walk. And it requires us to have accountability to that body. And accountability, while it is part of our Wesleyan tradition, it is a thing that a lot of even really faithful Christians struggle with. So the other thing, the other big point that I think Paul is making in this passage, uh, he starts making back in chapter 5 when he is big mad at the Corinthians because they are apparently boasting. They are apparently prideful, and Paul cannot tolerate prideful, boastful Christians. We see this come up in a bunch of his letters, that we don't get to boast about ourselves when we find ourselves in Christ. Any of our boasting needs to be in Christ. And really what he's trying to say here to these Corinthian Christians is that claiming new life in Christ, claiming that you have been saved, claiming that you have justification, claiming that your, your sins have been forgiven, that you have been, have been washed clean and are sanctified, does not mean that you have a free pass to do anything because you know you'll be forgiven. Now, church history is really funny because we see a lot of rulers in uh, usually like after the 300s when Christianity had become like a state religion but wasn't sort of as stable or as, um, didn't have as much doctrine built around it. We see a whole lot of, um, of rulers saying that they're Christian, wanting to be Christian, but waiting until they get until they're like on their deathbed to get baptized because they don't want to stop doing whatever thing they're doing because now they've been baptized. Even though they're like doing it wrong, they have an understanding of how important baptism is, how meaningful it is to say that you are now a Christian, um, and, and how that has to bring about a change in what you do. So what he's telling these Corinthian Christians is that you can't just do whatever you want knowing you'll be forgiven later. Instead, being a Christian is a, is a call to a life of giving up yourself because you're now part of Christ's body. And what Paul does in this passage, and I would recommend that you open up your Bible and actually read it because there's some quotation marks in here that if you just are listening, you don't see. But so Paul is taking some of the slogans that apparently the Corinthian church has about all things are lawful and food is meant for the stomach. These must have been sayings that they had about who they were. He takes those sayings, which are definitely like if you listen to them, an excuse towards I can do whatever I want because all things are lawful and food is meant for the stomach. They're rejecting the laws of Judaism is what they're doing. Um, but so they, he takes these slogans that they have and he turns them around on them at, to make, and, and he reminds them that, yeah, sure, like you're not subject to dietary or ritual laws around purity, but actually what you've signed up for is a, a direct call to holiness because you've see, received grace through Jesus Christ. You just have to live a holy life. You on your own have to give up things that make you impure or things that are sinful or things that, that cause you to stumble. You on your own have to give that up because you now have an identity in Christ. And this I think is, is exactly what uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that German theologian is talking about when he talks about cheap versus costly grace. Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace, quote, the preaching of forgiveness without the requiring of repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal, uh, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate, unquote. So 
Bonhoeffer nails it. Bonhoeffer knows exactly what Paul is talking about here with this idea of cheap grace. And the Corinthians are living a cheap grace, a grace that you don't take seriously, a grace that requires nothing of you, that you just say, yeah, I've got the grace of, of God. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I don't need to worry about how I'm living. The opposite of that, of course, is what Bonhoeffer calls costly grace. And that's a grace of dying to ourselves, a grace of taking up our cross, a grace of selling all we have to give it to the poor to gain eternal life. Costly grace is sacrificial. Costly grace recognizes what was given for us to receive that grace and is willing to leave everything behind to actually follow Jesus. And so Paul is reminding the first Corinthians that they have been bought with a price. That this grace that's freely given to them was costly on the cross. And that they should not forgive that, forget that. And that they need to watch how they are living. Now, these, I think, are much more universal truths than anything about sexual immorality or food, regardless of our context or Paul's context. These speak to bigger, more challenging ideas. They do challenge us to think about what we do, how we use our body. And in doing so, they remind us that we are joined together as a body of and with Christ. And that all of our actions or inactions or interactions are a reflection on our discipleship. And I think this is ultimately what Paul's trying to teach these Corinthians. He's trying to teach them discipleship. That the whole of our lives are being devoted to Christ. That grace is a costly gift. That we should be in the process of giving up more and more and more and more for the sake of the body and for the sake of Christ and for the, for the grace that we know. I heard someone say one time that we have already given up all of the sins that we want to give up. And that's the conviction of costly grace. That's what Paul is preaching. That's a life of discipleship. It's being led into territories where we are unsure, away from places that were comfortable and things that brought us quick joy. And why do we do these things? Because we were bought with a price. Because our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Because we know that we have true life, that we have eternal life in Christ Jesus.